for the touch of your lips, dear, but much more for the touch of your whips, dear. You can raise welts like nobody else as we dance to the masochism tango. All right, everybody, welcome to Ourgasm. This is the podcast where we talk about decolonizing sexuality and gender. I am Lindsay G. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. And I am Lenny Peppers. I use she, her pronouns. And uh, this week, we're going to be talking about beauty standards, which is a huge topic. So we're going to, you know, scratch the surface. Uh, But before we get into it, Lenny has something that she would like to read. In this podcast... We use the heteronormative terms of gender binary of men and women under the understanding that there are agender, androgynous, bigender, pangender, and gender fluid norms that exist outside of cisnormativity. While we tend to use the male and female as shorthand, this is not meant to undermine the very serious role of colonization in violence against two-spirit and non-conforming individuals. Even more so, this is not meant to obscure the reality that two-spirit and non-conforming people are the most likely to experience sexual violence, as we have mentioned in earlier episodes. We do not believe in the gender binary without fluidity, which is a Euro-Western construct that forced a strict gender division on our societies, which itself is a form of violence. Absolutely. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, That is going to save us significant time when we're recording each episode where like universally at some point one of us has to be like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Don't get mad, everybody. (laughs) (laughs) We're using these terms with the understanding that they don't apply to everyone. We're not mad at you, you know, etc. So uh, thank you very much for writing that. Uh, And yes, We heartily agree that diversity is, you know, what makes this world a wonderful place. And we don't want to be using restrictive language any more than we have to. Um, But, you know, that is, that's kind of the nature of the English language and many other languages. There's just not always the right language to use to include everyone that you want to. Um, so we we do try hard to use inclusive language where we can, but it's not always something that we can do. So, right, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I just think it's like really, really important to understand that we don't believe in a simple like binary yeah. gender division or like really many binary positions at all. Actually, uh, we just don't see the world that way. So yeah. Yeah. And uh, I one thing that like I tend to geek out about is uh, looking into like scientific research, um, especially as it pertains to sexuality. And I am always disappointed in the research that I find because like if you're talking about like uh, the way that brains work, it's always, always broken down to male and female groups. There's like almost never any mention of trans folks or non-binary folks or anyone. And I understand why the scientific community tends to go that way. You know, there's always, you have to think about where your funding is coming from and what those people want you to be researching. Um, and uh, most of the time you, you need a relatively large sample size and it can be very hard to select for, you know, non cis male and non-cis female people. There's a lot of reasons for it, but I feel like once our scientific research has expanded to include people who don't exist on the far ends of, you know, this quote-unquote binary, we're going to understand so much more about ourselves, and I am so excited for that to happen. Also, jokes on you, society. We pay for this out of our own pockets. Ha! (laughs) So we could say whatever we want. You don't own us. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but like, not just but gender binaries, but uh, I mean, we market this show as like decolonizing sexuality and gender. And what it comes down to is like, we don't even believe in the colonized to decolonized binary either. Like, I don't see the world in that way, even though that's the way that like, as a Native American, 
everything is written, colonized Mm. versus decolonized. And then also, I mean, even though we describe ourselves in like, like a way that suggests that everything is colonized, um, I don't necessarily see individuals as being that way. Oh, that's interesting. I want to talk more about that. Maybe we could do a whole episode on that concept at some point because I'm intrigued. Yeah. Um, I definitely do not have the language around that to do that in this episode. Though. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, we can put that off for another time, but I definitely want to talk about it because um, I find that like... And just in, in like social circles of mine, um, there's confusion over what even the concept of decolonizing sexuality means. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, just for a lot of people in like the broader world, decolonization as a concept is still relatively new and some people are not acquainted with it at all. So looking even farther, like beyond the concept of colonized versus decolonized and breaking that down is like, totally wild territory and i'm very excited to explore it let's put it in the context of a western film we only have the colonized and the colonizer and there's also like this binary of like good and evil or um pure and unpure or you know Right. And so there's always, like, as a Native American, we have gaslit into, like, believing that we live in all of these different binaries and that we walk on, like, this line and we have to choose between worlds. Like, are we going to live in, like, mm. the white world? Or are we going to live in the Native world? And when it comes down to it, like, that line doesn't exist. It doesn't exist for gender. It doesn't exist for humans. There is no line. We can exist in whatever realm we want to exist in. I could be a Native American who, you know, lives in the city while at the same time still, you know, practicing, you know, our traditional values. And there is no line there that tells me how Indian or how not Indian I am. And so that's what I mean when I say like when we're talking about decolonizing something, we're actually pushing it like more into a realm of where these two ideas aren't what defines us. Okay, yeah, I see, I see. That's a really, really beautiful idea. And I really like the there is no line concept. Like that's like, that's your Neo moment where the line ceases to exist and now you can fly. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You can do whatever you want. (laughs) It's so exhausting, though, because, like, as, you know, as cool as it may seem to, like, kind of break down that line and, like, realize that it's not there, everything that I read still draws that line. Mm -hmm. Uh, Every academic journal that I read, every uh, book, even just book that I read that is like for fun that has Native Americans in it has like this implied line of like what right. is and isn't real when it comes to your identity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of like all these people that I see on TikTok. Like, I'm not going to remember the guy's name. Um, TikTok is not very good for remembering people's names. But there's this one guy who um, did this little sketch about like, like, he's just sitting in, like, a restaurant, like, talking with his friends, having a completely normal conversation, and then, like, somebody walks in and is like, oh, my God, it's a Native American. And he, like, immediately, like, code switches. Yeah. And, like, flute music starts playing, and he starts <laughs> talking about the eagle soaring in the sky. And, like, that's that's the binary right there, right? Like, existing as a person. hmm And then performing as the traditional Native American that makes you really Native. Mm-hmm. That does sound exhausting. But it did make a very funny TikTok, so. <laughs> I mean, and is the basis for most of my comedy. So, I mean, right? <laughs> it's definitely something that I like. We can laugh at. But I think, in a way, that like 
breaks down that whole idea. I hope so. I hope that my uh, my tendency to try to make a joke when I feel either vulnerable because I fucked up or vulnerable because like you just said something that went really deep and I have no idea how to follow it. <laughs> I hope that that does not get overtly offensive, but please, if it does, feel free to call me out on it. Like, especially on this show, I want us to be examples of how to like own it when you say something that offends someone, if that happens. Like, absolutely. I, I feel like a, actually like an important part of the decolonizing conversation is white people learning to get over themselves a little bit and i mean as a white person who has like all kinds of privilege in our culture like i can definitely say that is it's hard to do it's hard to be told that you fucked up and to just say i am really sorry i did that and move forward um and it's especially hard to do it without without expecting the person that you offended to educate you about it like i definitely know that i do these things and i definitely know that i make jokes about things when i feel uncomfortable um or i just don't know what else to say so yeah if i do cross a line i very much hope that you will feel comfortable enough to tell me about it and then we can try to you know make good habits around that and and show our listeners that would be that's a goal for me anyway <laughs> Absolutely. I think you can say that we are comfortable with being uncomfortable, like stepping outside the box and kind of knowing that that's where all of the like good learning happens. Right. Yeah. But it is still it is still uncomfortable to be uncomfortable. And I want to be like honest about that and just let everyone know that, yeah, when I make an awkward joke, sometimes that's where it's coming from. Um Sorry, everybody, but hopefully at least the jokes are, like, somewhat funny. So <laughs> that's that's another goal of mine. I want to be a little funny sometimes. It's so weird, though, because being able to, like, step outside of your comfort zone and to, then to be able to admit that, like, there's been, you know, a mistake made or whatever is something, like, I rarely ever see. And I think that's what I appreciate about, like, being in a relationship with you and James because, I mean, we are all humans and we can all make make mistakes. Uh, I actually came across this earlier today. Uh, I was in my um, social justice and anthropology course that I'm taking at the university. And um, we had been given four academic journals to read over the weekend to discuss in class today. And all four of these journals kind of centered around um, colonization in anthropology and specifically um, like in the, na like with Native Americans. Okay. And so we had these four journals, we read them for class, and then we talked, discussed them in class. And um, at the end of the class, one of the students, also Native American, brought up um, the fact that all of these journals had been written by non-Natives. And we're talking about Native Americans, but we're not Native Americans talking about ourselves. Right. In 2020. Yeah. And the professor was like, that is my fault, and I will try and do better in the future. <laughs> wow, okay, cool. But I mean, her instant, like, instantly, like, she started to make a, like, a excuse for why that was, but then ultimately she just dropped the excuse in the end and was like, no, that's not good enough. I'm going to do better. Uh, and the excuse was, like, there aren't really that many Native American anthropologists who, like, write about these kinds of things. And then it came down to, like, nope, that's not good enough. Like, she fully admitted that she could have looked a little bit harder for, um, you know, journals written by Native Americans. So uh, it was really, really, like, 
humbling, but also like so good to see. Like it, yeah. it made me feel good, you know? Yeah. I think that one of the, the biggest problems that we have talking about privilege and white supremacy, um, like one of the biggest barriers to it is that a lot of white people literally can't see it. Like they cannot see mm -hmm. that there is a problem because they don't see the dominant culture, the people operating at the upper echelons of literally like any place you look. Um, they can't see the whiteness of these groups, these people, these institutions, because it's not, it has not been described to us as white. It has been described to us as normal. Mm -hmm. Like when I was growing up, my family instilled upon me these ideas like, we don't do this thing because it's trashy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, yeah, nobody wants to be trashy, cool. Um, and it's really only like now as an adult that I'm starting to look around and like really understand that me identifying something as trashy, almost always that thing is black. It's like all of black culture was described to me as trashy. Mm -hmm. And I think that that mode of thinking, like my parents are not racist my mother has actually like been like an anti-racist like crusader for most of my life. But I don't think that the things she taught to me as trashy were taught to her as having anything to do with blackness or whiteness. It just mm -hmm. was. These things are just bad. These things are just good. The good things are normal. The black, the black things, the bad things are not normal. They're trashy. And like, so... Although I definitely have racist programming. My mother definitely has racist programming. It's not been taught to us as racist. It's been taught to us as normal versus not okay. And that makes it so much harder for white people and people who are not white as well to recognize that the systems we're talking about are inherently racist because we, don't, we see them as just the way things are we don't see that there's an alternative and what we are trying to do with this podcast is like take all of these normal things that we're all used to dealing with every day in our lives and like pick up the rock and look at what is underneath it and what is underneath it is almost always racism and like or, yeah colonialism mm -hmm. and colonialism and white supremacy <laughs> yeah it's like what it comes down to yeah they're best buddies <laughs> yeah oh yeah uh, i actually call this like super woke class of super woke people my anthro apologist class <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's great i mean yeah like the idea the idea of anthropology as a subject is inherently like a colonizer mindset like uh, yeah, we it's... as the people who understand things and know things will look at other cultures as these like separate and like inferior small things that we can put under a microscope absolutely it's imperialist nostalgia mm -hmm. yeah uh it, i mean that's that's what it comes down to i do have a joke uh oh, good. that brings <laughs> us back into the beauty realm all um, right yes beauty so uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we're doing. Is, that's what we're what here for. This is about. Um, <laughs> and I think everything that we just said is important um, to all of the episodes that we have going in yeah. um, from here. But uh, basically, I have a joke that I tell on stage that is a true story. I went online and I went looking for um, like this lotion that like gives you like this summer glow all year round uh, made by a company that makes lotions and stuff that is also a bird <laughs> <laughs> uh so this specific lotion came in the mail and i have it right here uh it came in the mail and it came with a label the label says for normal to dark skin tones as if dark skin tones aren't normal. Yep. Uh, so I wrote the company and I asked them to change it to something a little bit more true. I asked them to change it to fair, right? To unfair skin tones. <laughs> <laughs> I 
which I, I was hoping that you would tell that joke. I know. I didn't even think about doing it until just now when you were talking about like, and it's sitting right here on my desk. I keep it here uh, to kind of like just remind me of like why I do the things that I do. Why I am the way that I am. <laughs> Why there's so much rage inside yeah. of you. <laughs> uh, but, um. I mean, it it comes down to identity, um, ultimately. Uh, the issue that I have had to come to terms with is that um, white people have preferences in deciding how to express themselves. Whereas... Uh, people of color lack the choices and must resign themselves to either conforming to or rejecting the dominant group's aesthetic values. In the case mm -hmm. of this lotion, um, I am rejecting mm -hmm. the fact that they called fair skin tones normal. But right. the thing that sucks is that I have to either reject or conform. Like, there is no... Yeah, there's very little, there's very little room to decide for yourself. Well, well, because everything yourself. is decided for me. If I <laughs> wear something that isn't considered like Native American regalia, then I am like conforming to like the colonizer's style of clothing, you know? And if I wear something that is like regalia out into public, say like I wear my ribbon skirt, I'm rejecting the dominant group's aesthetic values. Right. One time I wore like a pair of sweatpants to a comedy show. I, I actually wore like a whole designer sweatsuit, <laughs> like, a, like a jacket and sweatpants and cool shoes and I felt like hot shit. Yeah. But then the guy sitting behind me, I'm sitting there right in front of him. And I had just gotten off stage. I was filming this. I have this on camera because I was filming the shows oh that were happening on stage. But he goes, why do people wear sweatpants in public? Don't they know that the other people are going to see them? He saw mm. this style of athletic, like, awesomeness that mm -hmm. I was wearing as trashy because... right. He only apparently wears sweatpants at home. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the... <laughs> What is wrong with that guy? <laughs> but it was so... It, like, hurt me. Like, in the moment, it, like, right. damaged, like, the identity that I was trying to set up for myself. And it's something that he probably would never even have to think about. Right. That's a really good because point. Because as a cis white male... What he said is undoubted and unchallenged in American society. Right. Uh, and Yeah, and he has, like, the, the social currency to make you feel shitty. Right. The identity of, say, someone like me is looked at in comparison to or in opposition from the societal norm. White Americans right. have historically employed, either cautiously or subconsciously, the perspective universal voice to right. subjugate people of color and justify that subjugation. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all based on how you look. Mm -hmm. So like, basically like you stepping out of the house, almost no matter, no matter what the situation is, is almost always like a political statement because the way that people perceive you changes everything about the situation that you're right. in. Right. Uh, and I don't get to pick, like, my skin color is brown. <laughs> if I mm. leave the house with all six of my kids to go grocery shopping, like, that's not going to look great to some people. If I leave the house by myself and buy enough food for six people, <laughs> I mean, for six children, eight people, that's not going to look great for myself. I mean, so I have mm. to, like, look at, like, the way that society sees me in every single situation that I'm doing. And that includes what kind of beauty standards I have chosen to accept or reject that day. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Like, that is, it is not the same for white folks. Like, I mean, I one one thing that I have been thinking about a lot as I've been re- doing research for this episode is how, um, like I, I said earlier, that white supremacy and colonization are best buds. Mm-hmm. Um, and those two are also best buds with misogyny. Um, like, beauty standards are primarily used to police and oppress female identified people. Um, and then when you are a female identified person who has the intersectional identity of, you know, being a person of color, being an indigenous woman, um, it's like layer upon layer of lenses that people can view you through, like mm-hmm. that they that they understand enough about you just by looking at you to make a set of assumptions and then treat you according to those assumptions. And I think that that happens, I mean, that happens to everybody. Like, it is a natural process that we do judge other people based on what we can perceive about them with our eyes. I'm not going to pretend like that isn't just something that happens. Like, not going to go too far here. Um, But, you know, stepping outside of the house as a woman, as a white woman, is still political like i still have you know when i step out of the house i'm like okay am i gonna try to look nice to make other people feel comfortable Mm -hmm. like am i gonna smile at people to make them feel comfortable which actually has been one of the great things about the coronavirus epidemic because people can't really tell if you're smiling behind a mask so it takes at least like one little thing (laughs) off of my plate when i step outside the house um but yeah like am i gonna dress up so that people don't have a negative feeling about me? Uh, am I going to smile at people? Am I going to, like, play the part of the nice, smiling, easy-to-get-along-with demure woman? Or am I going to, like, butch it up? You know, am I going to display, like, my queerness in the way that I approach the world? Because um, that is a political statement, like, rejecting a lot of, you know, conventional beauty standards for women. Um, and then you know, inviting people to look at me and make a judgment and decide whether or not they're okay with my decision. And that is all reflected in how they're going to treat me. I feel like those are the main two, maybe three levels of like decision making about my own appearance when I leave the house. Right. Yours is compounded by multiple other layers of the assumptions that your appearance uh, leads people to make about you. Yeah. Uh, and I don't get to decide whether or not I'm going to leave the house and be brown today. Like, that's not a decision I get to make. Um, I just already am, and so I already have this level that I have to, like, you know, deal with in our society, and that sucks. Uh, because I, um, well, I mean, I, I had to come to terms with it. I mean, when I was young... I didn't feel pretty because I had darker brown skin. And even, like, some of my cousins who have, like, the same amount of Cheyenne, like, bloodlines in them as me have, like, blonde hair and blue eyes, you know? Yeah. Uh, But, like, um, having to grow up and, like, feel ugly because I didn't have the right color of skin tone, like, was something that I had to get past. And then... um, the next level of that was like being comfortable in the skin that I'm in, despite the fact that I may or may not be being judged at while I'm outside the house. Right. And then yeah. the next level of absolutely like accepting and loving who I am, the the color of my skin and uh, being able to wear my hair long and curly or straight or however I want to wear it that day without having to worry about what people are going to think about that. Uh, chances are um, I'm probably going to experience like more of this judgment because I am a comic and an actress and I put myself out on mm-hmm. stages. And so people right. have a higher tendency to feel like they know me because we connected in this visceral way on stage where I made a joke, oh, they right. laughed, yeah. they see me off stage after the show and I've had so many people, like, reach out and touch my hair, feel cool with, like, commenting oh on, like, how I look. And 
I went into this not realizing that that was going to be the case. Like I went into like well, putting myself out yeah. there as a public figure, not realizing that this was going to be the case. And then once again, having to like find myself in that cycle of like having to come to terms with it and loving myself for who I am. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like a note for anyone listening who hasn't gotten this memo yet. Um, it's not okay to just touch people. Like, yeah. it's not, it's not okay to just walk up to someone who you don't have a personal relationship with. Even if you do have a personal relationship with someone, like ask, Yeah, ask before you touch. And ideally, just don't even ask. If you don't know a person, chances are they don't want you to touch <laughs> yeah, their hair. Yeah, or, like, like, anything on them. Like, it comes down right. to, like, consent. Like, is this a person who you have any right asking consent from? Because, no, nope, you aren't entitled to any person, no matter who they are. But then also, right. like, if you and that person already have an established relationship uh, then you still need to ask for consent. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a tough one uh, for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, the same forces that have indoctrinated us into thinking that white skin is beautiful and blonde hair and blue eyes are the ideal, you know, they're the same forces that have taught us that if you are already in an established relationship that you don't have to ask for consent. Um, but none of that is true. It's just like fundamentally made up. So just getting that out there. Um, <laughs> I, for a while, considered the possibility of doing some stand-up comedy, um, because Lenny, you do, and a lot of our friends do, and, you know, I thought, I was thinking about, like, sets that I might be able to put together, um, and one of them was a set about being super white, like, so, so, so white, mm -hmm. like, when I go to buy makeup, I buy the lightest one that they have, and it's still often, like, too dark and looks weird and orange on me. So, just so for anyone who doesn't know what I look like, I'm whitey, white, 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 white. Um, <laughs> and it's funny, like, there are, there are parts of my life that are, like, it is ridiculous how pale I am. And I kind of put together this whole set of, like, trying to kind of make fun of myself in this way, but also trying to poke a little bit of fun at the culture that does assume that white skin is better by pointing out all of the ways that being super white and, like, blushing all of the time, getting sunburned if I'm out for, like, 15 minutes in, like, full sunlight, like, all of these things, like, they're ridiculous, and why would anybody think that that's better than all of these other ways of being? Um, and I never ended up going on stage with it because, thank God, I have, like, a, at least a small amount of self-awareness, and I was like, I mean, that's basically rubbing salt into the wounds of so many people who don't have the privilege that this ridiculously white skin gives me. And although I do want to make fun of it, and I do want to, like, poke fun at the idea that white is good, I just don't think that we're there yet. Like, I don't think it's funny I yet. don't think so either. Like, a year after I came out with the fair to unfair skin tones joke, which, by the way, is hilarious. Oh. A very good joke. Uh, there was another Montana comic who was also a woman who went on stage and she told an unfair skin tone joke. But hers <gasps> was that she was so light that she sunburned so easily that it was unfair. And so she's like, I guess you can define wow. my skin tone as unfair. And I was like, first off, <sighs> like, should I get up on stage right after her? and like tell my fair to unfair skin tone jokes so that people could see like the <laughs> difference there. But at the same time, it was, I mean, it was, I mean, I cringed a little bit cause I was like, yeah. I, I don't think that I'm definitely not there yet. Yeah, it's, it's, that's, it's tone deaf, you know, it's, com it's completely like not understanding the world around you. Right, um, I mean. And how other people experience the it. The difference is, is that I live in a world where only very recently I've been able to find makeup that matches my skin tone because they didn't mm -hmm. come in as many colors as they came in now. By the way, right. if anyone needs to know, I am golden beige. <laughs> um, but uh, like 
having to go through the struggle of never having to find, like, have a makeup that matches your tone, never being able to find hair products that are made mm. for my hair type. Like, if I go to a hotel, I can't just use the hair products that they have there. That will oh, fuck yeah. up my shit, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, but because white is the standard, white hair is the mm -hmm. standard, they have products for people who are not people of color in hotels. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah, and that goes back to, like, the idea that the that white is normal. So we're catering to the normal person, and that means white people. Um, and like, I'm sure that the people who make the purchasing decisions in most hotels are not trying to be racist when they do that, but that's, that's their basic understanding of the world, is that this is normal, and therefore we, were ca we will cater to this. Absolutely. Um, like, I do not believe that in every situation that this has been like an attempt at like not you know, making people of color comfortable in hotels or, you know, right. whatever. <laughs> I, I absolutely don't believe that. I don't think that these are conscious decisions. I fully realize that these are, like, embedded in today's standards right. of, like, what is normal and what isn't normal. Yeah. Uh, but we also have to realize that beauty is, like, ever changing like this is mm -hmm. like the standards of beauty are constantly changing and right. while this is not untrue when it comes to native americans it's hard to find a history on native american fashion because what well, we've been basically erased from it but yeah um we've also only been defined in uh largely pre-colonial history and so right um there's been like this beauty superiority that's been very like um there for me i've been able to see it from a very young age oh, wow. uh, just because i'm like i'm that's not me or anyone around me i grew up on a reservation and so like being mm -hmm. able to see what people look like on tv being seeing who's represented in magazines like right. beauty magazines and stuff none of those people ever look like me and so while i didn't yeah. like realize that it was like a superiority thing i and again i don't think that this is like on purpose but it's it did like give me a complex like as a as a young native oh, yeah. american girl you know right absolutely and like that's kind of the thing like so i i'm gonna i'm gonna get a little historical here Ooh. like break it down a little bit um so, like, obviously, like, what we're talking about Not is, like, beauty standards that apply. by the way. Hysterical. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, according to some definitions of hysterical, I am hysterical all the time. <laughs> um, by which I mean I'm hilarious. <laughs> no. um, but, like, you know, obviously what, what we're talking about so far is mostly, like, the way that current beauty standards have affected us personally mm -hmm. in our lives. Um and the, the reason that we are attaching these to <clears throat> colonization as a topic um, is because when Europeans showed up in the Americas, uh, they immediately established a power imbalance between them and the people who already lived here. And part of that power imbalance was like looking at the differences between the colonizers and the indigenous population and basically, like, coming up with ways to justify uh, taking their land, raping their women, selling their children into slavery, killing the men. And I think a lot of that is based on the idea that white people are inherently superior. Therefore, we're entitled to all of this. And the whiteness part of the power imbalance became an important an important part of justifying the continued process of colonization. Like, it wasn't just like, well, we have better weapons or bigger ships or whatever, therefore we have power over you. The actual, the actual identity of being white became integrally part of why we deserve to do these things to your people. 
And that whiteness then became part of the process, and it had to be held up as the standard, like the highest form of beauty must therefore be whiteness. And um, some of the research I was doing was saying that this, this idea of whiteness as the most beautiful way to be started around the 15th and 16th centuries, which is around the time that the Americas were being colonized for the first time. Right. And I, I want to add here that we have to remember that the people who created the framework by which beauty is judged were the same white academics and, dare I say, supremacists who created mm -hmm. the racial categories that we see uh, today. Right. Yes. Can we talk about the Pope? <laughs> I don't I don't have this information in front of me. Um wasn't thinking about it when I was researching, so I will probably not get like names or dates right. But it was right around the time that Columbus landed in the Western Hemisphere um, that the Pope made like, a papal bull, I think is what it's called, um, that declared that the white race was inherently superior. Specifically, I think that it was being applied to um, whites versus Africans, because that then enabled the slave trade to really start to flourish, mm -hmm. uh, the transatlantic slave trade. But like literally before the Pope said white people are better than everyone else, that concept may have existed in some people's minds, but it was not considered a fact until the Pope was like, all right, I've decided we need to profit off of this new world and we need slaves to do it and we need an excuse to take over all the land. So I'm telling you that God told me that white people are better than everyone else. And literally ever since then, whiteness has been held up by European colonizers and then in the Americas and through media and colonization to the rest of the world that white is the best. Um. I mean, obviously, like, that's a huge point in history where that happened, but it wasn't necessarily, like, unthought of because we had the Doctrine of Discovery uh, mm -hmm. a couple hundred years before that, which said pretty much the same thing. We can take land of savages because they obviously aren't taking care of it for themselves, you know? <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, so that's what another justification for landing in other countries and like planting your flag and being like, oh, this is like where we are now and you guys are savages. So uh, this, yeah. is, this is our <laughs> land, uh, whether that was true or not. And we know that it wasn't true right. because they also yeah. use the doctrine of discovery like as a way to like justify taking like Hawaii and they had an actual like hierarchical system with like a queen and with laws and they had they had a system let's just put it that way that yeah. that would have been <laughs> considered uh civilized but yeah. uh was still taken from them with the same justification and so right uh, basically what this is, is like the dehumanization or othering of a group or individual is abnormal or dangerous while at the right. same time reinforcing the dominant group's self-perception of being exactly the opposite of that, just and pure. Right. And so we have that whole like good and bad dichotomy, like happening oh, all over yeah. again. Yeah. And actually I found something on this let me see if i can find it in my notes it spoke specifically to that idea of of lightness and whiteness as purity so this is actually from a teen vogue article the connection between beauty and spirituality took a more prescriptive turn in the middle ages with the rise of christianity in europe when women were exhorted to appear pure and virginal and forever young um Light features like blonde hair, blue eyes, and fair skin were believed to be physical manifestations of the light of God. And then starting around the 15th century, which is right around the time that we started colonizing the hell out of the Americas, um, colonizers went to Africa, Asia, and Latin America and introduced the idea that whiteness is good and nothing is better than white. And I think that it's really interesting to 
reflect on the fact that this is still a part of our language, mm -hmm. whether this is something that we as human beings and individuals believe or not. You know, light equals good, white equals good. The white knight is the good guy. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples, but of course I mean, now literal, I'm blanking. like light and darkness is like considered mm -hmm. goodness and badness. Like they're like when and we badness. talk about like good and bad we always talk about like the light at the end of the tunnel like especially right now with COVID-19 everyone keeps talking about the light at the end of this dark tunnel right. and mm -hmm. um so it's definitely like ingrained in our language I have a uh project that I work on from time to time and it's another podcast uh <laughs> But um, it's called The Novel Savage, where I read romance novels that are specifically about Native Americans or include Native American characters in them. And there was definitely like the same pattern in these books, which tend to, I mean, we all know that literature and art and television and movies all tend to reflect like the societal worldview of the time. Right. And this has been, whether it's a book from the 1960s, 1980s, now, uh, it's it's been a trend, like, in these books, where we have um, the beautiful, often, like, white woman. Usually it's, like, a white woman who meets, like, this native american man and they're like right. you know scary and different and she's like pure and beautiful often virginal actually mm -hmm. like yeah that's a definitely a thing <laughs> one thing is clear in all of these books that i have read and in real life that the dominant group seems to subordinate and disenfranchise the otherized group and even commit like horrific acts of violence against them without feelings mm -hmm. of remorse or moral doubt. And so I like to huh. see this in the books, but then to know like how very, very real like this is and has been historically. Yeah, like how, how much on purpose it was mm -hmm. at one point, you know? And I think like, that's the thing, like so many of these ideas that like lighter skin, blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, like the basically European ideal for feminine beauty, we still tend to think of that as the right way to be, and we don't necessarily think of it as racist because we don't think it's intentional. Like, we don't think that we're taught that intentionally. And most of the time, at this point, I don't think that we are. But a long time ago, people definitely held that up as a beauty ideal on purpose so that they could do terrible things to other people. And then later on, as far as it applies to like modern beauty standards, like the beauty industry decided to uphold those ideals. And a big part of the reason why they decided to uphold those ideals is because they are so unattainable for so many people that the beauty industry can keep selling you shit mm -hmm. your entire life. Because if you are not a person who was born with the genes to make you look like that, you are more likely to keep buying their products your entire life trying to reach that ideal. And like you said before, Lenny, like beauty standards are always changing. Like I'm I'm getting close to 40 and I can look back over the course of my life and see the ways in which even our American like Eurocentric beauty ideals have changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that changes like every decade, probably less than that now that we're in the Internet age where like everything changes very quickly. Not only is the blonde, blue eyed, you know, big boobs, tiny waist, relatively large butt, but not too big, but, um, yeah. you know, pure pink lips, maybe a few freckles, but not too many but freckles. But not too, yeah, um, pink, but not too pink. Uh huh. Uh, not not like harlot yeah. pink, obviously, <laughs> and full lips, but not too yeah. full because then you start to look a little less white. Um, these are all constantly moving targets. So even if you are trying to aspire to, you know, the blonde and blue-eyed ideal, if you get there, probably the standards will have changed a little bit. So then you have to like switch. And I feel like um, that's particularly easy to see in the fashion industry where like literally every season, all of the designer clothes change 
so that you can almost never actually be up to date fashion wise. It's the same when it comes to beauty standards. Like, so when I was a kid in the 80s, the way that you were supposed to look as a woman was to have big hair, not particularly full lips, um, definitely very white, um, and you had like no butt. Butts were bad and scary in the yeah. 80s. But blue like, eyelids <laughs> were very not, important. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and giant earrings, very important also. Okay, okay, don't um, knock the giant earrings, okay, like. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with giant earrings, uh, but they were very important. Obviously, this is a podcast about sexuality, and so, like, sex drives power, which drives money, mm-hmm. which drives sex, which drives power. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, we have this triangle. And yeah. One of the things that you're kind of touching on here is that this like beauty superiority also falls into a classist system mm-hmm. where one's class can be guessed like based on the looks. Like, yeah, if you are able to like check off all of these different beauty standards, then obviously you're a person of a certain like class, right? And that's changed throughout history, where in some places women in history, but also in different places in the world. A woman who is heavier might be considered more beautiful because like clearly Mm -hmm. they're getting more food or, you know, they can afford more food. Or like in different places, paleness is a standard of beauty because you're not out working in the sun where, and so there's definitely like class standards of beauty uh, Mm -hmm. where at the same exact, like, things today can mean the exact opposite like somebody who has right uh, who is like heavier may be considered like less beautiful because they're not able to afford like clean food or go to the gym all the time right yeah um or have the time to like Mm -hmm. put in like get an hour worth of makeup to like look nice or to be able to afford that makeup. Yeah, that makeup. Right. Which is really messed up because when you think about it, a lot of jobs hire based on beauty. There's been studies done where, like, um, people who meet the beauty standards of the time are more likely to get hired than people who mm-hmm. aren't. So if you can't afford the makeup, if you can't afford the clothes to wear to the job interview, then you're less likely going to get hired right. for the job, yeah. uh, which is really messed up. And then when you do get hired for the job, especially uh, people who have like natural hair, you know, you have to meet the standards that are on these, the beauty standards that are in these employment handbooks. Right. Or even yeah. at school, like we're looking yeah. at like people enforcing like girls who wear spaghetti straps to school mm-hmm. while at the same time saying, oh, we can't make students wear masks, you know, like right. in the time <laughs> yeah, of COVID. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and like a lot of schools, like there's been a lot of uproar in recent years about like schools not allowing people to wear dreadlocks, you know, or people not even, like schools not even allowing like African-American students to just wear their hair natural. Like mm-hmm. it has to be like braided or, you know, kept under control, quote unquote. Even in the last couple of years, like... Native American students have had their hair cut in schools. That's right. Oh my god, I forgot <laughs> about that. Or have been kicked out of schools for for having like long hair, without people realizing that like Native Americans have had you know had long hair and were like stripped of their identity with the Catholic Church shaving our heads in order right. to force us into assimilation. Yeah. Yeah. And like, all of this is, again, like, I I feel like so much of it is done in the name of like, normalcy. You know, like, we don't want disruptions in our classroom. So we're going to, you know, send this girl home if she's wearing spaghetti straps, because boys can't control themselves if they see her shoulders. (laughs) Like, or, you know, we don't want this kid's dreadlocks to somehow disrupt the learning environment i don't understand how that works like um but you know like it's it's all very often done in like this like oh we're doing what's best for you 
kind of thing. And there right. is like a reality to that. Like being considered conventionally attractive, like you said, it gives you more opportunities employment wise, education wise. It just opens up more doors to you. Like being considered beautiful is power unto itself. Um, sexual power that leads to money power that leads to power power. Right. It is that it fits right into that triangle. Um, but we have to acknowledge that the beauty standards are by and large, they're arbitrary. Like some old white dude at some point, whether it was, you know, the Pope or somebody who got off of a boat, like on the shores of, you know, the Americas, like decided the way to be. And we are all still in a lot of ways, like living that out. Absolutely. Uh, they're arbitrary, but uh, not meeting these standards, especially for like BIPOC and non cis normative um, mm. people, still yeah. has real world um, yeah, absolutely. Circum like consequences for us that don't meet those standards. Right. Say I dress like the normal, like, uh, comic guy that goes on stage where I'm wearing a t-shirt I'm wearing <laughs> cargo shorts and I have my hair pulled back in a ponytail and I'm not wearing any makeup like I'm going to get as a, a woman who's on stage I'm going to get less laughs I know that because I tried it yeah <laughs> I oh wanted my God. to see what would happen if I went on stage without makeup if I went on stage with lots of makeup if I went on stage in a dress if I went on stage in a t-shirt and there are definite noticeable differences when I went on stage with like a pair of Spanx on and a dress and full makeup and my hair fixed and high heels and right. I'm comfortable, like I'm uncomfortable for the entire night, but I got more laughs that night, you know? Right. Uh, and well, at the same time, I made a joke on stage once about um, cargo shorts and a white straight male comic got pissed off and told me to check my privilege oh my <laughs> god what <laughs> while i stood there in spanx and the most <gasps> uncomfortable tight dress and my boobs pushed up to my chin and my high heels oh and my god. told me to check my privilege. I, I totally have some guesses about who that might have been. Um, <laughs> but we are not shit-talking people in this show. <laughs> no. But, I mean, that's something that, like, I think needs to be brought into the conversation, right? Like, the lengths that especially female-identified individuals will go to to try to measure up to beauty standards are extremely, I don't know what the right word is, long? We go to long lengths? High lengths? <laughs> we go to great lengths. They're big. They're big. Um, <laughs> the biggest because, of lengths. <laughs> because like along with the idea that, the, that white beauty ideals are the right ones, um, we've also been taught that women, because we have fewer, um, we have even in today's world, like fewer high paying job possibilities, you know, we are supposed to be making babies and not focusing on our careers. Like our best chance of a good life is to get a good husband. And in order to get a good husband, you have to meet these beauty standards because that's what men want. So whether that is true or not in today's world is kind of beside the point right now. Like the point is that we have been taught as female people that maintaining our appearance and presenting the best possible version of our appearance at every possible moment is like, is, it's our greatest ideal. We are supposed to be pretty. When we do not present ourselves as pretty, we get worse outcomes. We get fewer laughs on stage. We get fewer job interviews and job, you know, placements. We don't make as much money. Like, this is very real world ramifications of beauty standards. And so. If you present yourself as too pretty and something happens to you then that is also right our fault. also your fault yeah. yes yes yeah because if you're too pretty then you make people uncomfortable because they can't focus on their work because your shoulders are showing like there's there's no way to do it right, right. like well, well, i mean you know, people often people get 
um, blamed for their own rapes because of how they were dressed. Mm-hmm. Because were they wearing lipstick that night? Were they wearing a low cut <gasps> shirt? Was it red lipstick? I mean, that's the worst kind of lipstick. <laughs> well, we no, all know. There's a classy um, red and there is a trashy red. But oh, right. It's all just red, <laughs> and I've never been there. <laughs> like it's, I've never been able to understand like that line of like why there is this or why there is that um yeah like why michelle obama got like shamed for burying her shoulders well at the same time like other first women didn't get shamed for the same thing like there's just i mean it's just so arbitrary it's so horrible well i think i mean that goes right back to the race thing Like she, you know, every move that she made, especially as first lady, was under so much more of a microscope because she was the first black first lady. And, you know, therefore she both needed to play it super safe and do everything according to the book, but also be a little sexier because, you know, women of color are hypersexualized in our culture. And if she didn't, if she didn't live up to both of those simultaneously, she was always letting somebody down or opening herself up for criticism just by being. I made this list, and it is not an exhaustive list by any means, uh, but it is a list of the lengths that people go to and have gone to historically and go to now in order to meet their culture's beauty standards. So Ooh, right? I just started writing things down as I thought of them. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of documentation, so there may be things that I've heard that are not entirely true. I'm just going to go for it anyway. So, one, uh, in Victorian Europe, and pro- I think long before that also, uh, women would put drops of belladonna in their eyes to dilate their pupils so that their eyes would look shinier and sparklier in, like, indoor lighting. Um, and that did have the desired effect of dilating your pupils, but it could also cause tons of health problems because belladonna is straight up poisonous. Um, Not to mention the fact that when your eye, your, the pupils of your eyes are artificially dilated, like you can't see where you're going. Like you can't focus your eyes. So women were literally like half blinding themselves to go to a ball where they would have to like be doing fancy footwork and like weaving their way through like huge crowds of people just so that their eyes would look sparkly and they would be prettier to the men in the room. At the same time, uh, in the same time period, people were using all sorts of toxic substances in makeup, like all kinds of like lead and like horrible chemicals were going into the makeup that was being used. Um, At that point, they may not have known that like mercury and lead were poisonous to you, uh, but people were definitely suffering the effects of that. I mean, that reminds me of the radium girls who were putting it on their putting like radium lace paint on their fingernails. Oh my god. Uh, you yeah. in their eyelashes, you know, oh, on their right. body so that they could glow when they go out at night. God, that is horrifying. I mean, and that is as soon as 1970. Yeah. Like the 1970s when when that was happening. And like there are still all kinds of toxic things that go into a lot of our beauty products like um nail polish and nail polish remover that shit is toxic as hell like it should not go on your body and yet we do it all the time i do it because you know it's fun to have shiny pretty nails and then you feel like sexy when you do but if you want to get that shit off you're like coming into contact with things that are meant to hurt you (laughs) i'm not i chew it up Oh, that's probably good for you, too. Put it straight into my body. Yeah. (laughs) Cut out the middle Um, man. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And the same with, like, tooth whitening. I mean, like, bleaching your teeth. It's not good for your teeth. It's not good for the rest of your body. There are other methods of tooth whitening that aren't as toxic, but there's a long history of people trying to brighten their teeth with things that are extremely bad for their health. Um, Conversely, and this is something that I wish I'd had a chance to look up Uh, but I didn't, is that I have heard that um, basically like pre-Western contact uh, geisha in Japan would actually blacken their teeth. That Mm -hmm. That was a beauty standard thing, which sounds like unthinkable to us today and just goes to show that, you know, beauty standards are very culturally tied 
I'm thinking about all of the people that I personally know, but also all of the stories that I've read about women of color using bleach on their skin to try mm -hmm. and make it paler. That's a huge one, um, yeah. And then, of course, there's the Chinese women with the foot binding. Yeah, that was literally next on my list. Yes. Ah, okay. That is Talk a about whole that. thing. Well, and again, I don't know enough about it to really have, like, a discourse on it. But for, you know, quite a while, like, foot binding, they literally broke little girls' feet and mm -hmm. bound them so tightly that they couldn't grow. And when they did, when the bones went back into a shape, they were unable to walk on their feet. And this was considered pretty because tiny little demure feet were the rage at the time. And I mean, those women could never lead a more normal life. They could never go no. just do things for themselves. Not only that, not only did it handicap them for the entire rest of their lives and was completely normalized for a lot of like people when, uh, World War I happened and people had to walk long distances to try and, you know, save themselves from, like, getting bombed. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these women didn't, weren't able to make that distance. Oh, my God. People died by the road, you know? Yeah. And so this thing, this normalized beauty standard ended up being, like, really deadly for a lot of people. Not, and, I mean, that's not even to mention the gangrene that people, mm -hmm. like, little girls died from. Right. Well, like, with improperly, like, cleaned and wrapped feet, which God. all of the foot binding was improper. Like, you shouldn't, <laughs> break, you shouldn't break people's bones in order to make them meet beauty standards. Especially, you shouldn't... like, in children. Like, it's one Absolutely. thing to, as an adult, make a decision about, you know, some change to your appearance that you decide to make for your own reasons. Like, I have no judgment for people who change their appearance because they want to. Girl, get it. But leave kids alone. Like, Oh, yeah, <laughs> totally. Do not do that to um, the children. To make, you know, people's parts more appealing to the other sex like there's mm -hmm. been a lot of like genital mutilation done yes. and it's still being done today like i yes like for both men and women mm -hmm. yeah and i want to i want to mention just quickly i feel like this is probably more of a something to talk about in like a fashion oriented episode but um a lot of the things that have been prized as beauty standards for women involve doing things that are harmful to our bodies, and often doing things that make us either become more helpless or appear more helpless. And that is, I mean, there's so much behind that, but it's very much based on, I think, uh, the idea that I mentioned before of women being forced to be more virginal and more young looking and therefore more pure. There's like, I think the infantilization aspect of that is like oh help i couldn't possibly run away from a predator in these high heels you know oh i can't carry the things that i need for my day out in public because i don't have any pockets like these yeah. things that make us rely on other people or just be you know less able to take care of ourselves are often things that are directly tied to us looking pretty mm -hmm. um, and foot binding uh, is kind of like the one of the more extreme examples of that yeah. Um, I like to draw the bottom eyelashes white and the top eyelashes black so I look like I'm scared to attract, like, the opposite sex. <laughs> God, that's... Oh, I was just going to say it. I was just going to say, oh, my God, that's so dark. <laughs> Ta-da! We have come full circle. Yeah. <laughs> um, some other things to consider... Hair dye. Hair dye is toxic, man. Like, and again, I, I have dyed my hair. Dyeing your hair can be really fun, but like, it's not good for you, you know? Um, hair removal uh, from our bodies primarily and our faces as women. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not supposed to have hair pretty much anywhere except on our heads and our eyelashes and our eyebrows. Um, so we take hair off of most of our body, but then we buy fake hair to put on our eyelashes and our eyebrows and on our heads and just to follow this up we're not going to talk a lot about hair in this episode because that is a thing that is yeah. it's very own episode is hair 
and beauty and sexuality. Hair. I feel like we probably need to open that with like some song from the musical Hair. Just putting that out there. Or Hairspray, which True. I know every song to, to that one yeah, as well. that's a fun one. Okay. Um, also, piercings. Um, like I just said, you know, like, don't force your beauty standards on your kid. Well, like, most people who are assigned female at birth in America get their ears pierced, like, when they're very young. Mm-hmm. Um, if not, like, infants. That happens. Yes, I've seen infants with piercings. Yeah. Um, not just ears either. Oh, yeah? Uh, but we do have to, like, look at, like, tribal, mm. like traditional standards of beauty as well like tattooing piercings Mm -hmm. and the cultural like aspects that go behind all of those as well like there's definitely like different um ways of looking at all of these different standards of beauty but when it comes down to um poking holes in children and finding their feet for the sake of like getting them like the best um the best husband husband <laughs> or a partner for the future right i think that that's where um we should kind of really take a step back and and look at yeah yeah and a lot of these modifications you know can be made like ritually or you know as part of like you said like a cultural like a coming of age ceremony mm-hmm. or yeah and so like i guess i should say that like you know, not all of these things I'm saying are, like, inherently bad. I'm not going to judge you if you have whitened your teeth, like, um, but it is just kind of putting into perspective, you know, how, how much we as human beings want to live up to our cultural beauty standards, because we, we want to be pretty, and that's legit, that's fine. But, you know, I, I think it's important to be a little bit aware of where a lot of these beauty standards come from and so that we can make our own decisions about whether we want to conform to them or not. Um, some other quick examples are dieting, which is also a whole other episode. Um, yeah. But, I mean, like, the lengths that people have gone to for the sake of their diets sometimes uh, is pretty extreme. Um, tooth straightening. Uh, and just one tooth just one just this one tooth right here just um, that tooth just, straightening like the, the pain and discomfort that i went through in my teen years uh for the sake of tooth straightening and then they just went right back to where they had been before <laughs> all of the orthodontia um neck lengthening uh is a thing uh particularly in myanmar um there have been groups of people that did like head, like forehead flattening um, as part of their cultural beauty standards. Um, there's uh, lip plates that people in Ethiopia put in to, you know, extend their lower lips. That's like a very beautiful thing for those cultures. Um, and then when it comes to lips, there's lip injections, which we do much more in the Western world. Um, there's Botox which can reduce the appearance of wrinkles and fine lines and can also reduce the size of your cheeks if you think your cheeks are too big. Um, And that's before we even get into surgeries for the sake of beauty. So there's, you know, taking fat out of your midsection or out of your butt and putting it into another part of your body or taking fat from another part of your body and putting it into your butt. That's a whole thing. Uh, There's stomach stapling. which I am not saying is only a beauty thing. A lot of stomach stapling can be much more medical than just cosmetic. I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong. I think it's blepharoplasty eyelid surgery, which is uh, wildly popular in Korea and in other places in Asia, um, trying to get a more Western-looking eye configuration for your eyelids. Obviously, augmentation of the breast or the butt um, altering facial features with nose jobs, etc., tummy tucks, boob lifts, and that is where I ran out of things that I could think of that people do <laughs> to meet their beauty ideals. Yeah, I fully plan on getting a boob job, uh, not just for beauty ideals, but like, um, you know, because I had and nursed six kids, and I just really feel like that took its toll on my boobs. Uh, I did get my belly button pierced when I was younger 
Uh, so that's another one, like belly button piercings, uh, which I thought was super, super cute. But then I was pregnant, like, mm -hmm. as a teenager, not long after that. And it stretched uh, and left scar tissue all the way up to the top of, like, to my sternum. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I have, I have a belly button piercing stretch mark that goes all the way up. Um, makes it look like I have heart surgery. I've had heart surgery. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah but either way huh. it's like um <laughs> it's, it's badass either way also a tribute to like how the body can like crew like stretch to like have another human or two i had twins at one point inside you and then like to shrink back down again and so like <laughs> um if we were able to like look at the natural mm, yeah um things that our body has that would normally be considered ugly and to like maybe take a twist on how you look at it then hmm. you know maybe accepting yourself like i said yeah i had to go through like these different like acceptance points for myself throughout my entire life and so that was one of the things that i had to like learn to deal with was like yeah not everything's going to be the same, but, um, you know, it's, it's not the end of the world either. And there are, you know, while some of these things may be destructive to my body, I'm still going to dye my hair. I'm still going to paint my nails. I'm still going to wear makeup and I'm probably still going to get a boob job, you know? <laughs> yeah. And like, that's, that's the thing that is kind of hard to grapple with, honestly. Like, you know, especially as someone who identifies female, like I have a I have a strong urge to tell people, you know, like, fuck the man, you know, look how you wanna look. Um, but I feel like with that mindset there's kind of an inherent lean toward like be more natural. Don't alter yourself. Accept yourself and love yourself the way that you are. And I do think that, like, that type of messaging of just acceptance and love for who you are naturally is something that is largely missing from, like, the conversation that we have about beauty culturally. Like, like I said before, like, the entire point of the beauty industry is to sell you things. And the only way that, right. the, the most effective way, I should say, to sell you beauty products is to convince you that there's something wrong with you in the first place. And therefore, you have to fix it. So, like, I have this this urge to tell people like you're wonderful the way you are don't change anything but conversely like if you want to change something i think you should be able to change something like it's your body it's the way that you look anybody should be able to make their own decisions about what how they want to modify you know them themselves selves, not other people right exactly <laughs> if you want to modify yourself as a way to like you know be more of the person that you identify yourself as, right. then that is amazing. But don't try and force other people to live up to your own, like, standards of what they should and shouldn't look like, yeah. I think. And also, like, again, let's not break little kids' feet anymore. Right, yeah. And, like... Like, let's not, let's not break little kids' bones anymore. Yeah, and, like, not do violence to children. <laughs> that seems like... <laughs> Can we agree on that? <laughs> um, but also, like, if you have a desire to modify your body, I think it is worth considering where your where those motivations come from, you know? Um, because a lot of us, like, did have violence done to us as children, whether that was in the form of, you know, somebody literally, like, doing bodily violence to you, um, or just constantly getting the message that you are not okay, you're not enough, mm -hmm. you know, you are not beautiful the way that you are. Um, and it can be very difficult to really pick apart as an adult whether your motivations are due to what comes from your heart or what people have told you about yourself. But that's the kind of investigation that I think is often really worth doing. Um, but, you know, by all means, folks, if you want to get friggin', if you want to get butt implants and, like, 
one of those like wild uh, extremely long like manicures with like things dangling off the tip of them or if you want to shave your head or if you want to dye your hair or if you want to like put 20 tattoos on your face like get it you know do do what makes you feel like the best version of yourself uh we just you know we want we want to point out that I guess being blonde and blue-eyed with the perfect size breasts and the perfect size waist and the perfect hip-to-waist ratio is not the only way to be beautiful. And, you know, we're all, we're all working toward really actually believing that, um, but it's hard because we really have literally been taught that that's the way to be. Like, I often think of absolutely um, Marilyn Monroe, right? She's mm -hmm. very often held up as like the ideal American beauty, blonde you know, big eyes. I don't, did she have blue eyes? I don't remember. She might have had brown eyes. I can't recall. Um, you know, perfect hourglass figure. She was so beautiful, but she had extremely low self-esteem most of her life, and part of that is due to the fact that, um, I think it was her foster mother, possibly her adoptive mother, I don't remember the legalities there, kicked her out of her house when she was a teenager because she was too pretty. And she was afraid that her husband was going to go after her. And, like, I feel like that right there is the double-edged sword of beauty standards. Like, you can be literally the most beautiful woman in the world, and you're still not doing it right. Right. So, love yourself. Do what you need to do to make you the best version of yourself that you want to be. That you feel like you are, you know? But also remember that beauty is not decolonized, quote, unquote, yet. Yeah. That, that there are people out there who have violent reactions to them trying to be the best versions of themselves, no matter what. Yeah. Whether it be the color of your skin, whether it be wanting to wear, like, a dress over, you know, a pair of pants or you know it, there's like actual consequences happening to people out mm -hmm. in the real world right now because of the fact that we can't accept that they know for themselves what's best for themselves right <sighs> well here we are and we're depressed and <laughs> we probably need to wrap it up Obviously, there are, like, multiple other episodes within this topic that we are probably going to come back to multiple times. Uh, but until we do that, we invite you to come back for our next episode, which is going to be about gender roles in ancient Rome uh, and how those affect our gender roles in America today. Uh, featuring Jenny Williamson of Ancient History Fangirl, which is one of my favorite podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I'm a little bit of a history nerd, so I'm really, really excited for that. I am super stoked too. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited. Let's do that. Uh, and that has been this episode of our hour and a quarter ish gasm. <laughs> and Lenny, by the way, you're beautiful. Oh, thank you. I know. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, that is the right answer. <laughs> All right. Ciao, everybody. We'll see you next time. Let our love be a flame, not an amber. Say it's me that you want to dismember. Blacken my eye, set fire to my tie as we dance to the masochism tango. At your command, before you here I stand, my heart is in my hand. Ugh. It's here that I must be. My heart entreats. Just hear those savage beats. And go put on your cleats and come and trample me. Your heart is hard as stone or mahogany. That's why I'm in such exquisite agony. My soul is on fire. It's a flame with desire. Which is why I perspire when we tango. You caught my nose in your left castanet, love. I can feel the pain yet, love, every time I hear drums. And I envy the rose that you held in 
your teeth, love, with the thorns underneath, love, sticking into your gums. Your eyes cast a spell that bewitches the last time I needed 20 stitches to sew up the gash that you made with your lash as we danced to the masochism tango. Bash in my brain and make me scream with pain, then kick me once again and say we'll never part. I know too well I'm underneath your spell, so darling if you smell something burning it's my heart. Excuse me. Take your cigarette from its holder and burn your initials in my shoulder. Fracture my spine and swear that you're mine as we dance to the massacre. Kiss tango.